My name is Megan Senatori, and I'm the Associate Director here at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. On behalf of CALS and our co-hosts, the Center for Business Law and Innovation, welcome back, and we're delighted to turn to our third panel of the day. The next panel will address labeling controversies. What can businesses call their alt protein innovations and why does it matter? I am joined today by Amanda Howell and Jamie Athos. I'm gonna introduce each of them. Amanda is the senior staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. She works to combat humane washing, unconstitutional ag gag laws, and the animal agriculture industry's attacks on plant-based foods. Prior to joining ALDF, Amanda co-headed the food law practice at the Stanley Law Group, where she focused on state and nationwide class action litigation. Before that, she served as assistant director of litigation at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Amanda has contributed two chapters to the book, What Can Animal Law Learn from Environmental Law? She's also contributed to the National Association of Consumer Advocate Standards and Guidelines publication, as well as the National Consumer Law Center's Class Actions Manual, among others. Welcome, Amanda. Next, I'd like to welcome Jamie Athos. Jamie is the president and CEO of the Tofurky Company. With more than 14 years of experience building and supporting its growth, Jamie is energized by the ever-increasing opportunity and adoption of plant-based foods worldwide. Prior to his current role as president and CEO, Jamie held a variety of other positions within the brand that is also his family's business. From a college summer job making tempeh to roles in quality assurance, research and development, and operations. Jamie is also a founding member of the Plant-Based Foods Association, where he currently serves as secretary after serving for several years as president of the board. The association aims to ensure a fair and competitive marketplace for all businesses selling plant-based foods, promoting policies and practices that improve opportunities for the industry and educating consumers. Welcome, Jamie. Um, with that, Amanda and Jamie will do a joint presentation. Uh, Amanda is going to bring up her screen share, so we'll get that going. We're going to save about 20 minutes on the back end for questions. And as with our other panels, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. And don't hesitate to ask them as we go along. Thank you. All right, and I just want to make sure that everyone can see my PowerPoint that's up. Is that going to get an audible? Anyone? Yes? Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you so much for having us. I think we're both really excited to be here. Um, this touches on some of my favorite cases near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, of course, we're here to spend time talking about what plant based producers can label their products. Um, we're going to cover the applicable federal laws, the new state laws that kind of pose obstacles to some uniform, longstanding, um, and legal, according to FDA regulations, naming practices that plant-based producers have used. Um, but the answer to why does it matter, I think is much simpler. Uh, it's basically, we're just here to ensure uh, an even playing field for plant-based producers. Um, it ensure that, vote, that would protect consumer access and understanding that's so that like, consumers can vote with their dollars um, and, uh, have their purchases reflect their morals. Um, so as is obvious, I work at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Our mission is protecting the lives and advancing the interests of animals through the legal system. Uh, and one way that we do that is by supporting plant-based producers. Um, you know, I think it's pretty much common sense, but increased market share of plant-based products means there might be a decrease in demand for animal products and thus hopefully fewer animals are killed um, to be used for food. Um, so I think in that way, uh, we are directly aligned with uh, principled plant-based producers like Turkey. Okay. Um, well, I should tell you a little bit about our company, I think, to start off. Um, so the Tofurky Company, we're still a family-owned independent company. I think Megan mentioned me and mentioned that. Uh, we were founded back in 1980. My stepfather, Seth Tibbet, um, is the one who started it. And actually, when he founded the company, the, the word Tofurky did not exist. Uh, he called us initially Turtle Island Soy Dairy. Um, because back then, soy dairies were springing up, especially on the coasts and in kind of liberal hippie enclaves, coincidentally, because um, there was already this notion that was going around that it would be a net benefit uh, to society uh, if we could get away from animal agriculture as the foundation of our food system. 
And if we can derive milk in the form of soy milk and uh, kind of center plate proteins in the form of tempeh and tofu, then really do we need animal dairies and ranches at all? You can already see shades of those the kind of the conflicts that we're going to talk about today over nomenclature in that question. Um, but anyway, so Seth invested his life savings in starting a food company and, you know, one at that point that really just made tempeh uh, up until about 1995 when he launched his first Tofurky branded product. Um, this is our current vision. Um, which I would just sum up as if companies like Tofurky do our job, then we don't need to shame or coerce people into making better food choices. They'll make them naturally because in doing our job, um, we're making tasty, affordable foods, making sure that they're available in the grocery stores where people shop and in the restaurants where they dine um, and that they fit within kind of the culinary uh, habits and practices that are probably personal to them and their own family. Um, and actually, can you go back one slide? Uh, there's another part of the vision um, that I think is there at the end that centers around the role of business in society. And this is something that, you know, I, I care a lot about um, as a reluctant capitalist, I guess is how I describe myself. Because um, we are, the U.S. is, uh, highly consumer society, consumerist society, but one with kind of a relatively low political participation, a fairly shallow political dialogue. And I think this creates an opportunity or, or maybe even an obligation um, for companies to talk about values with their consumers uh, and to communicate kind of on their behalf of those consumers when they talk to media or elected officials to kind of amplify that voice. Um, because what we choose with our consumer dollars and how the companies that we support involve themselves in that public conversation is another proxy for our own personal politics. And, and maybe one that speaks a little louder than we could as individuals, because a company has the legitimacy, you know, louder bullhorn, first of all, and also that legitimacy of having a lot of supporters slash customers behind it. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so we are in a, a really interesting time to be in the plant-based industry right now. I, I, I'm sure you all at this point have heard about Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and seen lots of articles about the rise of, of kind of plant-based consumption and demand for plant-based. There are really a few primary reasons that people are gravitating toward plant-based. You know, number one, um, maybe not in terms of rank, in terms of uh, how many people cite this one, um, but one that's kind of growing, the fastest growing one is concerned about the environment. You know, anybody who's concerned about, uh, you know, climate warming and whatnot has probably heard that their food choices are a contributor to kind of the overall outcome uh, and are probably thinking about ways that they can make changes to do better. Uh, another motivator uh, is individual health and public health. You know, plant-based products on average are healthier for you. And the third one is animal welfare or other types of ethical concerns. Um, we've seen, like I mentioned, a huge upswell in interest and demand for these types of products. Uh, about nine point, well, depending on where you read, these numbers go up and down a little bit, but you can tell uh, consistently across all of them that there's been an increase. So this Ipsos retail poll finds that 9.7 million Americans follow a plant-based diet, which is up from only 290,000 in 2004. That's a huge increase. Uh, and further, um, you probably have heard the term at this point, flexitarian, um, which is you know, a way of kind of labeling people that are probably one of the bigger categories of plant-based consumers, and certainly one of the bigger categories of tofurkey consumers, which is people who are just cutting back. They're eating less meat, they're eating more plant-based or whole foods plant-based as a result. And this has led to uh, obvious increases in demand. Um, so sales numbers show that plant-based foods grew about 11% since last year, based on syndicated data. Dairy milk sales have, uh, so this is real animal dairy milk sales have decreased from 2015 to 2020. And um, concurrently, the non-dairy milk sales are now up to 13% of the total liquid milk category, which is substantial. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so here is an example of some of Tofurky's labels. Uh, you know, the labels are at issue in some of these legal fights. Um, this is our plant-based burger, similar to what you'd buy from Impossible or Beyond, and I should call out the nomenclature we've used here, plant-based burgers. So you see that uh, in consistent uniform type size and weight all in one line, very simple and uncluttered by a lot of, you know, other verbiage. Um, I'd also like to call out the way that we've used our face panels here as billboards uh, for our own advocacy. So we wanted to uh, advertise the importance to us as the company of climate change and issue a call to action also. This phone number that you see on the purple package here is the switchboard for I think the House of Representatives or Congress basically. So it's a way to kind of at that moment of purchase decision to spur our consumers to think about maybe having a conversation with their elected representatives. Um, and let their values be known and the importance of that to them be known to their representatives. I'd love it if more companies would do things like this, maybe not exactly this, just to make their own values clear though, and to invite consumers to be a part of uh, whatever the changes are that company's uh, seeking. Uh, personally, I think Patagonia has been a company that I've drawn a lot of inspiration from. Um, they're not a plant-based company by any stretch of the imagination, but I have a huge amount of respect for their participation in kind of hot button political issues like the Bears Ears National Monument, and really just their trust in uh, and their kind of transparency with their consumers. It's something that I try to emulate with Tofurky's uh, marketing as well. So I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's an example of some of our other product lines. Um, so this on the left is our plant-based deli slice. This is the ham flavored one. Um, and take note of the, the nomenclature here. So the red package, you know, again, that's the ham deli slices. And take note of the relative type sizes of plant-based versus deli slices and the prominence of those words, like where, you know, what eye line are they on and things like that. Because these are all kind of relevant to this. Um, you know, as a marketer of products, we think about, you know, the hierarchy of our face panels a lot. And um, this is the outcome of that. And, you know, obviously, we're not going to get a lot of repeat customers if we deceive them. So our goal is to make sure that people know they're getting a plant based product, what it's going to taste like, uh, they might get some kind of notion of how they might integrate it into their own culinary endeavors. Um, and hopefully they'll be happy with their experience and be a repeat customer. We're not trying to deceive anybody. Um, and I don't think that looking at these packages, you get that, <laughs> that you would uh, uh, take from them that we're trying to deceive. Uh, you know, plant-based is the, the highest, uh, other than our brand itself, right below that is the, the term plant-based. Um, note also, there's some additional qualifiers, like, you know, the deli slices, it says smoked ham style. You know, we're trying to have call outs and qualifiers here to indicate that this isn't just ham, that it's something different than. And again, this is the reason that people are buying our products. We're proud to say it. We're not trying to deceive anybody here. I'd also call out, um, there's a little round symbol at the bottom of the kielbasa package, three leaves and a round symbol. You probably can't read that, but that says certified plant-based. And adjacent to it is a KSA PARV designation. So if you know uh, kind of kosher dietary law, you'd know that PARV is a product made without meat or dairy or other animal ingredients. That's another way of indicating that this is a uh, plant-based uh, product, not a real animal product. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so not as many people as I'd like know this. Uh, this is a little disrupted by the pandemic, but uh, during the first year of the pandemic, we were launching our sister brand, which is a non-dairy kind of cheese alternative brand called Mucho. And again, let me point out some of the features here. On the left, we've got our cream cheese style spread. And at the very top line, you'll see plant-based and dairy-free in the middle dairy-free again. And then once again, we're using style as kind of a qualifier. This isn't just cream cheese. This is a cream cheese style spread. On the upper right corner there is our shredded cheddar cheese. And again, these are not just cheddar. It's cheddar style spread. We're trying to really do what we can to, to let people know what they're buying here. I think that's it. So I think you know, taking a look at Tofurky's labels, um, both for their plant-based dairy and plant-based meats, 
I would say that they're pretty illustrative of the industry. I think it's kind of common sense that these uh, products are not trying to be misleading, as Jamie said. Uh, you know, they wouldn't get much repeat business if they were doing that. Um, and again, they're trying to distinguish and differentiate their products from plant-based or from uh, animal-based products. Um, so I think that that's, again, kind of common sense. It's already uh, kind of in line with the business's objectives. But another reason that, of course, uh, plant-based companies and frankly, all food companies out there um, are not misleading consumers is the fact that there is already a really robust state and federal labeling scheme, uh, lots of laws in place, basically, that would prevent um, producers, plant-based or otherwise, from misleading consumers. Um, here, I've just kind of put the applicable labeling laws, things that govern that, you know, Jamie and other producers have to comply with. Um, if you're a plant-based product, you fall under FDA uh, jurisdiction. If you're, you know, meat and poultry products um, and non shell based eggs, you're under USDA. Um, but, you know, both FDA, USDA, and even FTC, which governs um, marketing, um, all of these separate statutes have provisions that prohibit labeling or advertising that's false or misleading in any particular, um, you know, kind of identical language um, at the state level. So we have all these, you know, robust federal level things. Um, and then you have at the state level, a lot of states have adopted FDA, USDA, um, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, USDA Act, all of these things exist at the state level as well. Um, and then on top of that, you have your state um, consumer protection laws, uh, unfair, deceptive acts and practices. That's what UDEP stands for. Um, all of these things ban um, false advertising, misleading consumers. Um, so, you know, these laws exist. Um, I would also say that there is a pretty robust uh, mechanism for enforcement of these laws. Um, you know, you have uh, federal agencies can enforce them, state AGs can enforce them, and I'm calling out uh, consumer protection laws here because even your individual consumer can actually enforce these laws via state protection or consumer protection laws. Um, you know, each state has its own and it basically gives people a private right of action, they call them mini um, AG laws. Uh, so if you were misled by a product, you, you can have a class action, this is actually what I used to do, is sue companies for violating FDA regulations. Um, and I mentioned this in order to, you know, not just point out a popular or common enforcement method um, to prevent companies from misleading consumers. Um, I think it's also good because when you're having a class action that's alleging violations of labeling regs, including um, anything that's required to be on a label or anything that's misleading in any particular, courts basically test for us whether that's true. Um, whether people are misled, whether, whether the conduct or, or labels are misleading, and they do so using a reasonable consumer standard, which is an objective standard. Um, it basically asks the trier of fact to determine whether any reasonable consumer is likely to be misled. Um, there have been a few cases against plant-based producers, um, specifically dairy producers, and uh, <laughs> you, there, there are so few of them because they really didn't pass the laugh test. Um, but it's good because we have case law, at least, that makes the determination about these plant-based naming conventions that we're discussing um, for, for milk products. Um, and basically, after all of those failed, I think your plaintiff's attorneys decided, we're not going to do any more of these because they're going to fail. They're so silly. Um, and I think that's also the reason we don't see any of them um, for plant-based dairy or meat products, because I don't think any... Uh, plaintiff side attorney with his, his or her salt would, would take on that case. Um, just to you know, read some language from these uh, opinions, because I think it's kind of fun. Um, there was a case, Gibson v. Trader Joe's, um, and the court opined that reasonable consumer, indeed, even the least sophisticated consumer does not think soy milk comes from a cow. To the contrary, pe people drink soy milk in lieu of cow's milk. Another case, Aang v. White Wave, dismissed that false advertising suit. Um, that was uh, products labeled soy milk, almond milk, and coconut milk for implausibility, and among other things, uh, finding that the plaintiff's argument that any reasonable consumer uh, assumes beverages came from cows because the package used the term milk stretches the brown bounds of credulity. Um, they found it highly improbable for a reasonable consumer to, to believe that. They also, in dicta, said that it would be equally improbable that a consumer would believe, believe veggie bacon contains pork. So again, these, these courts are not... Um, 
they're basically making the determination for us that these naming conventions, and if I haven't said so yet, the naming conventions we're discussing is basically a qualifying term like veggie or vegan or plant-based paired with um, a, a traditional meat or dairy term like veggie sausage or vegan milk or, or, or what have you. Um, we also have uh, good language from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the, la the largest court of appeals in the country in Painter v. Blue Diamond. And that also dismissed um, a misleading advertising claim for almond milk producers. Um, and they commented that no reasonable consumer could be misled by defendants unambiguous labeling or factually accurate nutritional statements. So I think that, you know, we haven't seen a lot of movement at the federal level. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of um, states pass new laws, but at least in terms of um, testing these things out in the courts, um, we're very much uh, kind of um, winning on, on that. Um, in terms of naming conventions, uh, just to back up a little bit, um, FDA does uh, require certain things to be on labels. Um, the front of package is the principal display panel. One of the things, one of the very few things that has to be on a package is something called um, a statement of identity. Um, statements of identity are basically the common or usual name for a food. Um, it basically has to say the, what they are in a truthful, um, truthfully convey the nature and contents of products. Um, it's to answer your questions about, you know, what is a product? If you go to the grocery store, you'll see, you know, Cheerios, for instance. Um, and in tiny little type, you'll see toasted whole grain oat cereal. That's the statement of identity for Cheerios. Um, as long as something, is, the statement of identity is truthful and non-misleading and is the common or usual name, companies basically get to decide what the heck they want to call their products. Um, one that kind of was burned into my brain because I sued them. It was vitamin water. And their statement of identity was nutrient enhanced water beverage. It's like, what? I don't, I'm not sure that consumers know what that is, but hey, you know, it's a, what Coca-Cola said was truthfully conveying the nature and contents of the product. So sure, like that's the statement of identity. Um, and, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of food products on the market. Um, and each of them, most of them have statements of identity and fall under these regulations, 21 CFR 102.5. Um, there are only, there's something else called a standard of identity. Um, FDA has only established about 300 standards of identity across 20 categories of food. Basically looking at the, you know, historical background, FDA, I think, and, and I'll try and make this as succinct as possible, decided we're going to have recipes for everything. A standard of identity is going to exist for all of these foods. Um, and then, you know, it took 10 years to promulgate each one. And it started with kind of foods like uh, milk products and tomato products and things like that. Basically, they were concerned about adulteration and kind of sham products being sold, cheaper knockoff products um, and confusing consumers that way. After trying this in the you know early 40s and 50s, FDA said, there are too many products out there. How about let's not do standards of identity anymore. We're going to come up with a statement of identity thing. So there are standards of identity um, with standardized terms. Um, and that's distinct from statements of identity, which plant-based producers use. Um, I would say that, you know, when you, and I'm, I'm giving this kind of as context because the first kind of iteration, I think, of the animal agribusiness, uh, folks taking um, umbrage with plant-based producers, was by complaining to FDA um, and state uh, regulators that plant-based producers were running afoul of existing standards of identity for milk and uh, meat products. Um, so the, I think the very common sense retort to that is FDA and USDA have long held that or even promulgated standards themselves that have standardized terms within other things. So when you look at peanut butter, that has the word butter in it. Um, it's peanut butter though, it's not just butter and both peanut butter and butter have standards of identity. It's completely fine to have butter as a term as a part of a larger statement of identity. Um, almond butter, for instance, that's fine. Um, cashew butter, coconut milk. These things, again, have been accepted by FDA uh, and you can see that through their non-action. They use it in their own guidance documents. 
So I think we have a very clear retort to the industry saying, hey, uh, you can't use the word milk, even though you say soy milk. You can't use the word sausage, even though you say vegan sausage. Um, so yeah, <laughs> sorry for that boring regulatory background. I'm gonna pass it back over to Chief. Yeah, um, so I am not an attorney. You'll notice that I'm not making references to CFR and whatnot in my part of this presentation. Um, I was pretty naive about the, the process of creating new legislation. I would have assumed that for a state legislature to pass laws, you know, premised upon consumer confusion, that they would actually demonstrate consumer confusion first, but that hasn't been the case. Um, that was a little bit of a surprise to me. Um, and in fact, the legislative record is um, in you know Missouri, the first case in particular is what kind of comes to mind, is full of examples of um, that, that clearly not being the goal of those, uh, those legislators. Um, and so ultimately, Amanda and uh, the Feltzes here, Feltz and Feltz, a husband and wife duo of academics, <clears throat> uh, set out to kind of investigate the, cl the claims of consumer confusion. You know, do things, do qualifiers like plant-based, uh, veggie, meatless, do, the, do things like that actually do the job of informing consumers appropriately, or are they confused by those things? And this first survey is an investigation of kind of plant-based milk products, and long story short, um, there's always some level of confusion, like yeah, that's, I guess, to be expected that, you know, some people are confused by everything, but between plant-based and animal-based kind of nomenclature, um, there, there's similar amounts of confusion, but the, you know, qualifiers of plant-based and whatnot didn't add additional con confusion. And uh, ultimately, the conclusion is down here on the second paragraph, which is that consumers are accurate at identifying plant-based and animal-based milk and cheese products as being plant or animal-based. They're not confused about differences between them. And the word milk is not some magic totem that suddenly confuses people. Uh, next slide. Um, similar kind of outcome with Feltz and Feltz's second survey. This one, I think, also included some uh, plant-based uh, meat alternatives as well. Um, but similar kinds of numerical uh, outcomes and whatnot. And the conclusion here is people are fairly good at understanding these simple adjective labels. And I think we're talking here about qualifiers like plant-based, like vegetarian, like vegan, things like that. And so they're also likely to be good at identifying using and understanding information on plant-based food labels and understanding key differences between plant-based and animal-based products. Um, this kind of notion that people you know, that their brains went out the window as soon as they saw an animal term and that's all they could focus on. They're just not supported by the facts. Uh, next slide, please. And um, here's another survey, uh, Jared Gleckel's survey, um, kind of, you know, repeating the same kind of uh, inquiry and finding that not only are consumers not more likely to be confused by plant-based product nomenclature, but kind of point number two here, which is if you don't use those familiar terms like sausage or burger or whatever, then consumers are left even more confused by what it is that they're eating. Like if you take, you know, we're, we're all familiar with veggie burgers. If you take away the term burger and say like patty or puck or something that's not been traditionally associated with animal products, then people don't know what they're buying which should not come as a surprise, very predictable, but here it is being kind of demonstrated empirically. And I would add, uh, not to be a spoiler alert here, but of course, because Jamie says, and I think again, we all can intuit, uh, if plant-based producers couldn't say sausage or veggie sausage, no one's gonna know what that thing is gonna taste like, how to use it, sales are gonna drop. Um, so I think that that it's, it's no huge um, leap to say that's, you know, especially given the lack of consumer confusion and empirically shown lack of consumer confusion, the, the actual causing confusion and um, uh, handicapping plant-based producers and preventing consumers from really knowing what the plant-based produ products are is probably the impetus of these um, actions and uh, taken by the animal uh, producing industry. Um, so speaking of industry action against plant-based producers, um, Again, this is a long and storied history. Um, this is not anything new. Um, basically for the past, 
and this is applied for both dairy and meat uh, producers have taken umbrage with um, you know the increase of sales in plant-based and increase in competition. Um, and their reaction to that, then the dairy side, the National Milk Producers Federation has been sending letters to FDA for I think about two decades complaining about uh, plant-based dairy producers violating standards identity. FDA hasn't done anything. FDA doesn't want to do anything other as it, it would have if they were actually concerned about any confusion. Again, these products have been on shelves for decades. Um, it wouldn't have taken, you know, pushing from National Milk Producers Federation for FDA to do something. Um, and uh, even after, you know, 20 years of the, these nudges, um, FDA finally uh, opened up some requests for comment about standards identity. Uh, their way of doing it was basically asking the public, should we even have these anymore? Should we modernize them? Are, are they even uh, useful? So that's still under review, FDA, again, it's a, it's a slow moving uh, machine. Um, because it's so slow moving, uh, and that probably angered the animal industry uh, and the milk producers, um, they started trying to get legislators on their side. Uh, at the federal level, um, Tammy Baldwin put forth the uh, Dairy Pride Act, um, which is a ridiculous act, basically designed to prevent plant-based dairy products from using these terms, even in conjunction with those qualifying uh, terms. Um, that didn't get anywhere. Uh, I think the first time that she put that forward was 2018 and then again 2019. I don't think that anything happened with it. Um, we also saw at the federal level um, for those meat producers that are concerned about plant-based competition, uh, the U.S. cattlemen uh, petitioned USDA basically saying, please create standards identity for things like beef and meat so that they exclude, explicitly exclude plant-based uh, meat products from those definitions. Uh, the problem with that is, uh, as I said earlier, and I think this is funny, maybe you guys don't, but they were just completely barking up the wrong tree. USDA doesn't govern, doesn't have jurisdiction over uh, plant-based meat products, that, that's FDA. So they just sent the petition to the wrong, to the wrong folks. And after I think about two years or three years, USDA told them that, <laughs> that that was their response to the, uh, petition um, to create those standards identity for to exclude plant-based. Um, they also got a legislator to sponsor something called the Real Meat Act. And that was, again, kind of relying on standards of identity um, to say that anything that didn't conform to standards of identity should have, be forced to be labeled as an imitation product, which that sounds unpalatable. And I think, again, that's pretty clear that that's designed to dissuade consumers from buying these products. Um, so either, you know, if they had their their way, plant-based meats would either have to say imitation meat really big, which might gross some people out, or they wouldn't be able to use that meat terminology and then people wouldn't necessarily know, what do I do with this thing? I don't know what to do with a veggie disc, you know, so I think that was pretty clear. Um, we, that's all kind of at the the federal level. And as you can see, you know, USDA and FDA had very little inclination to do anything. Um, which is probably why the next kind of wave of action taken by the animal industry was at the state level. Um, so, oops, sorry. That, so, oh, that's just some of the, the slide is some of the letters from NF, NMFPF to FDA and then the cattlemen's petition. Um, at the state level, back in 2018, um, Missouri was the first state to pass basically a, this, this language right here, it said, um, no person shall engage in any misleading or deceptive practice, practices. And then they go on to basically say, an example of that, of a misleading or deceptive practice would be misrepresenting a product as meat that's not derived from harvested production livestock or, or poultry. If you're sitting here looking at that and being like, what, what does that mean? Uh, that makes two of us. Um, I think that it's a very, very vague law. It could be uh, applied to almost anything. What does misrepresenting a product as meat mean? Does that mean, you know, just making it in the form of a sausage? Does that mean if it is in the form of a sausage, does picturing that on a label, does that run afoul of this law? Um, does it apply to all of the marketing in, in addition to the labeling for these products? There are a whole host of questions here. Um, 
And what's particularly scary about this statute that was passed again, and this was uh, a woman who straight up said that this was um, Sandy Crawford, I believe. She just said to the press that this came to her from the Missouri Cattlemen's Association, the state level affiliate. They just handed her this draft of the bill and she sponsored it. So this, there's no really mystery about where these, these bills are coming from, where these laws are coming from. I think that, again, given the empirical evidence that we have and then the fact that these products have been on shelves for decades shows that there's, the, the true concern is not consumer confusion. Um, I think that, again, it's, it's competition. Um, and I was saying that the, this law was really, really scary because this is not a civil law. Uh, this is a criminal provision, which means that um, a violation of this could mean that per violation, uh, a CEO like Jamie could spend a year in prison in Missouri for selling his products uh, and a thousand dollar fine per product sold and also advertised. So this is, you know, a, a really kind of vague and broad scope ban on speech. Um, that was again brought and handed to legislators from uh, the Cattlemen's Association. Uh, the that was 2018. The very next year, uh, in 2019, Arkansas passed this law, um, which prohibits representing an agricultural product as meat when it's not again from high harvested production meat, slaughter slaughter based meat. It went even further and said it banned using a term. I'm going to say using because it's not utilizing. <laughs> that has been used or defined historically in reference to a specific agricultural product. Like if we're sitting here trying to figure out what that means, again, like that is incredibly vague. I don't know that that gives a person, um, like a producer that produces plant-based meat or even dairy. I don't know how they would know whether they could comply with that. Um, and used or defined historically in reference, like that, that could be a whole number of things. And in fact, um, looking at the legislative history here, um, this law was designed to apply not just to plant-based meats, not just to plant-based dairies, but also uh, cauliflower rice. The uh, sponsor of the bill was a rice farmer. He's a legislator slash rice farmer, and he wants to get rid of, again, those same naming conventions, cauliflower rice is the statement of identity there, but he's saying you can't use the term rice. Um, so I think that that's... I have a and nice little <laughs> historical sidebar there also, Amanda. I felt like that was so absurd as well, the riced, you know, potatoes. Mm -hmm. I the, the earliest patent I could find for a device to rice potatoes was 1909. This is a problem. They've, uh, we should um, commend them for their patience and finally 100 <laughs> plus years later dealing with this really rampant problem of people using the term rice inappropriately. Left and right, people are buying cauliflower rice and getting home and being very confused. People are take buying tofurkey uh ham roasts and being like but but this i thought this was a dead pig and you know <laughs> broad runs amok um also in uh 20 i think this is 2020 um louisiana passed a similar law um and that prohibits any producers representing a food product as meat again really broad because what could representing a food product as meat mean Oh, and I am reminding myself, um, the enforcement of these sometimes is at the you know state level, the Bureau um, of Standards, things like that. Uh, Missouri was left to whether, what the heck these, these terms mean representing or misrepresenting something as meat was left to the determination of 115 county prosecutors. So they were handed this law and say, go throw people in jail based on this law, um, which is an incredibly scary thing. And, you know, if you're a, plant-based meat producer, and you see this law being passed, I, I think that, you know, that's going to at least chill your speech, if not outright change your conduct, which again is what they were intending to do. Um, and I, I don't think it's just a coincidence that we don't have plant-based alligator on the market. I'm going to say this law <laughs> in particular chilled that opportunity. Yeah, I, I was really excited about that one day, but... <laughs> Um, and again, Louisiana, Arkansas, they're all very, very broad. They're designed to apply to plant-based dairy and meat products. Um, and rice and who knows what. Um, and again, it's it's citing when when we get down to it in these lawsuits, they cite concern for consumer uh, confusion and preventing consumer confusion. But if you look at the legislative transcripts, um, all they're talking about is uh, protecting their industry, which we'll see in a second. Um, the next kind of 
fate of laws that we saw getting passed um, is kind of exemplified by the Oklahoma one in 20, I believe 2020. Um, this one isn't a ban like the other laws. It's a, it's a disclosure requirement. So it's basically saying you can't use these terms unless you uh, have, uh, they're not, you can't use these terms because that would be misleading unless you, the packaging displays that the product is derived from plant-based sources in type that is uniform in size and prominence to the name of the product. Um, so that's basically adding a lot of hoops to jump through for plant-based producers that I think I've never gone to the store and been confused, but I will say they do, plant-based producers do disclose that they are plant-based in a number of different ways. Jamie mentioned the vegan seal. You can have the name of the project in a couple different places. You can have a co separate call out that says vegan really big. Um, but this is basically getting down into the nitty gritty and being overly prescriptive and trying to take flexibility away from plant-based meat producers um, in terms of their labeling on the front of product, which is really valuable real estate. And if plant-based meat producers were forced to change their labels for every single separate state, they of course wouldn't be able to sell their products on a nationwide basis. Um, I'd, so I, I'd also interject here that, you know, right now, plant-based is, is a selling proposition for consumers. And this would, I think in a, a narrow reading of it, would limit our ability to emphasize the plant-based nature of the product. We can only go as big as, you mm -hmm. know, the, the, the name of the product. And oftentimes our company, our peer companies in the plant-based space, we want to say it even louder that it's plant-based. And obviously that's not going to make people more confused about whether it's plant-based or not. So I, I don't like that this ties our hands in that way also. Yeah, I agree. I think that whether it's a ban or disclosure requirement, I think these laws uh, so kind of suffer from some similar problems. I think that they're all pretty vague uh, and wide ranging. Um, I think that because they're vague and ambiguous, I think that that encourages inconsistent, arbitrary, and I wouldn't even say predatory enforcement. Um, if you can't tell how to comply with the law, or if you, like, your current labels aren't in uh, compliance with the law, that's of course going to chill your speech. Um, that might even chair, scare, and, and Jamie probably can speak to this more than me, but um, you know, retailers might be scared uh, by carrying your products because this might apply to them too, not just the producers, but the fact that they have um, call outs in the store and, and marketing that, that might make them liable under these laws. I think that um, it's not crazy to say that plant-based companies might have changed their behavior, refrained from rolling out that uh, alligator, plant-based alligator um, or other products. They might, you know, we, we do know that producers like Tofurky have refrained from saying certain things because of fear of enforcement under these laws. Um, and I think that changing labels to comply with these laws would both be impractical, but also impossible because they are getting a patchwork of these laws. How do you comply with both Oklahoma and Louisiana's? Uh, North Carolina passed one that said, you know, against dairy. Um, so this is, it's the whole reason why we have the FDCA, the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, is to have a uniform nationwide labeling scheme to enable people to sell products across you know, state lines. Um, so these are really, and some legislators, state level legislators have said that's exactly why they're passing these laws is to uh, kind of nudge the federal government into action by, because the, there's this gonna be this uh, patchwork of laws. Um, and again, uh, having to worry about enforcement or the cost and fear of changing labels, um, that's all just, uh, you know, trying to, undermine the competition, I think. Um, and I also do want to say that Oklahoma's law is a little, because it's disclosure requirement, um, it's not so much a, a First Amendment question because that's a harder uh, road to hoe when it comes to the level of scrutiny that applies. Um, so really focusing more on how this disclosure requirement uh, burdens interstate commerce, especially when considered uh, considering the legislative history that shows that you know, this is a discriminatory intent um, that the state interest cited is pretextual and the real interest really is uh, regulating or, you know, hamstringing uh, interstate commerce. Um, so these are all laws that have been affirmatively passed, but I don't want to leave out the, uh, the unfortunate situation of these, you know, lobbyists and industry actors getting to um, certain 
state agencies and getting them to use existing laws in inappropriate ways, which is what we had by the California Department of Food and Agriculture unfairly and um, kind of discriminatorily targeting plant-based dairy products. Um, and uh, Miyoko's Kitchen, uh, which as many of you might know, create, has vegan butter and vegan cheeses. Um, and they got a letter in December, 2019 from the California Department of Food and Agriculture citing existing federal regs that Miyoko's was in compliance with, but they were saying that based on those regs, um, Miyoko's couldn't say things that were objectively true, like 100% cruelty and animal free. Like this is a vegan butter product. Of course, it's animal free. Of course, it's uh, hormone or lactose free. Um, they said that she couldn't use the phrase revolutionizing dairy with plants. Um, and my personal favorite <laughs> in this uh, very short kind of scary letter was uh, CDFA instructing Miyoko's to remove the image of a woman hugging a cow on the website. It was a, a, a volunteer at Miyoko Sanctuary hugging a rescued dairy cow. Uh, and they said that that was confusing to consumers and would consumers would associate it with um, dairy. Um, so uh, I think that again, talking about the fact that this, these types of both past laws and enforcement positions on state on the state level is um, again, at, at a minimum chilling truthful commercial speech. I, I alluded to this because this is maybe my favorite part. <laughs> uh, I keep mentioning legislative history and how we know that these laws are not, you know, just worried about consumer I'm understanding. I'm not sure if it's just me, Amanda, but I'm not seeing oh. the slide. It's just I a know. blank slide. Oh, okay. Sorry. Wait for it. That's oh, sorry. Kind of There's pop. a big reveal here. Sorry. Yeah, there up. is. <laughs> There's a big reveal. Um, and I just wanted to pull some of my favorite quotes from the legislative history um, for the legislators that have passed these laws, ready? And again, contrast what you're seeing here with the fact that everyone afterwards says, oh, no, 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 we're concerned about consumer protection. We're concerned about consumer confusion. Well, that's not what that says, right? What What about this? That's, that's our product? Okay, Where am I? I I'm not seeing anything about consumer confusion here, are you, Jamie? <laughs> um, and again, protecting agricultural producers in the state uh, by attacking one industry in order to shore up another by chilling free speech, that's that's not constitutional. Oh, we're not done yet. We work with industry, that's the reason we're here. That's what the commissioner in Louisiana that passed the law said. The reason that the legislators were there was to work with the industry and represent the industry interests, not consumer interests. Um, same thing in Oklahoma, help our beef producers. This is again in the legislative transcripts uh, for these laws. This is not taken out of context. Um, yep. I mean, it kind of kind of goes on. And you know, it kind of makes sense too when you look at the states that have passed these laws. They are the very ag heavy states. Um, these legislators are beholden there to these um, industries. They, you know, are a huge percentage of their GDP. Um, and you know, they are representing their interests um, and they don't see protecting plant-based, which is, uh, I would say, a more sustainable, innovative and growing industry. Um, that's just not kind of on their, their right at oh, I thought I was done, but. And if I could interject briefly, <laughs> I'd also point out animal agriculture is not the only agriculture. You know, animal agriculture is supported by plant-based agriculture. All those feed crops come from, you know, non-animal agriculture originally. And I think the short-sightedness is so frustrating to me here. Those are unsustainable industries that they're propping up. They're doing that, you know, on the backs of the average everyday consumer, ultimately. We're all paying for the externalities of this, you know, destructive agriculture choice that we're making. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, you look at, these these kind of very short-sighted quotes um, and you pair that with the utter, utter dearth of empirical evidence showing consumer confusion. I don't think that you know, it's it takes a genius to figure out where these laws are coming from, why they're being passed. Um, I'll pass it over to you. Um, yeah, so maybe you could help me with these prompts also. I think you put this slide together, but did you want me to walk through kind of our, the steps that we take for compliance with this first point? I think that uh, you know, speaking from your perspective, um, I think that just the importance of com compliance and yeah, mm -hmm. and the steps that you do take um, and whether you guys have had any enforcement action taken against you in, in your time at Tofurky or, you know, at PBFA. 
okay. um, and also the timing of these laws and these sudden concerns. Yeah, well, I, you know, we're all consumers here, and I think that we all understand that there's a regulatory body out there that's looking out for us as consumers. We hear about recalls all the time. Maybe if you're a food industry professional, you even focus on the nature of what those recalls are. Oftentimes, they're just about disclosure. They're about accurate representation of what's in a given product. Um, Oftentimes that's motivated by concerns about, you know, the allergens in those products and the, ultimately the safety of the people consuming those products. And that's awesome. Um, but there's a huge bureaucracy that's kind of been established and there's a huge, you know, the CFR has been established also for all of us who are in the business of making food to do it in a way that, you know, protects the interests of our consumers, but also is, you know, in accordance with you know, the regulations. And so we're all reading the FDA's guidelines for how to uh, package and how to speak about our products accurately and taking our guidance from them. And they've given us a few different kind of avenues to do so, you know, one of which is, you know, the nomenclature issue itself, we've got a few different things that we can do. If there's a standard of identity, we can conform to that. We have to make a statement of identity and tell people what it is and it has to be accurate. Um, but, you know, Tofurky is a great example of kind of other strategies that are codified in law. Um, one is kind of is it fanciful terminology? I think I'm using the right FDA approved language for that, which is you can make up words. Um, and tofurkey is an example of that. It's a uh, you know, portmanteau of tofu and turkey and you jam them together and you get tofurkey. Uh, and that's allowed, you know, that's not uh, against the rules. In fact, it's explicitly within the rules. Um, other things, another avenue is kind of common or usual name. Um, and they've, again, that's all codified and you can use common or usual names. So I prefer that one personally. I mean, Amanda walked us through how standards of identity are just too onerous to maintain and keep accurate and they take too long to generate and they're just not going to keep up, especially in the time I think of kind of social media and the internet age and whatnot where language moves faster than it ever has. And insofar as companies are, you know, using the language that their consumers use, that's a good kind of, you know, check against confusion. And they've given us that avenue and companies like Toferky and others have taken that avenue. We've tried to, wherever we can, use the proper qualifiers. You know, all of our package labels are also independently audited by a third-party compliance expert. And we think that we're 100% within the boundaries of the law at the federal level. Um, but that doesn't mean that we feel safe. You know, Amanda talked about you know, Missouri being a criminal law. You know, we sell, have sold tens of thousands of packages of Tofurky products in Missouri. If you multiply that by $1,000 per iteration, uh, add maybe $1,000 more per iteration of advertising within, within Missouri and the internet's everywhere. So all of our advertising's in Missouri. I don't have that much money. And out of a one year per iteration in terms of jail time, I don't have that many good years left. Um, the good news though, is we've never had a consumer contact us because they thought that they were getting a real meat product and they accidentally got Tofurky instead. We've never had an FDA inspector or a state department of agriculture inspector tell us that anything that we were doing was outside the boundaries of the law. Never gotten an enforcement letter like Miyoko unfortunately got. You know, we've, as far as we can tell, we're 100% within the lines and that's really where we want to be. And I just um, want to add there, Jamie, if I may, uh, we yeah. did send uh, public records requests to these states that have passed these uh, either bans on speech or, or disclosure requirements and asked for them to give us all of the consumer complaints that they had about plant-based meat products and none of them had anything. So. Oh, imagine that. So it turns out it's not just us who have never received you know, any complaints or confusion, any indications of confusion. It's pretty uniform across the, the board. Um, so the timing of these concerns, it's hard not to notice that, you know, I talked about this big groundswell of interest in plant-based products. We've all seen, you know, the articles about the success of, you know, Beyond Meat going public, and it's just very much uh, in the news, and, and people are talking about it, and consumers are seeking it out. 
kind of suspicious that suddenly plant-based is doing well and that's when we need to do something about this plant-based phenomenon and that legislative record that you know some of which uh, amanda shared shows very clearly what their concern is they weren't concerned when it was just tofurkey out there you know we're we're doing well as a company, but we're not a multi-billion dollar company like Beyond Meat. And so suddenly this wasn't just competition, it was real competition. And uh, it's hard not to believe that it's, you know, something more than a coincidence. This was all about protecting the interests of the Cattlemen's Association. That's why they created these this draft legislation. That's why they found their friends in legislat legislatures to uh, sponsor it. And that's why we are where we are right now. And this is not sustainable. You cannot run a national brand like Tofurkey, international brand like Tofurkey, if every state has its own uh, prescriptive labeling requirements. That's just not practical. Um, kind of behind the scenes of, you know, how your products get to your grocery store, your local grocery store, there are distributors involved and they span multiple states. Those grocery store chains, they stand, span multiple states as well. They don't have systems in place to um, direct only compliant packaging to the states where it's compliant and whatnot. This is just an unworkable kind of uh, thing to deal with a patchwork of different state labeling requirements. And ultimately, it's motivated by protectionism and not by any real consumer need. So that's one of the reasons that Tofurkey has taken up this fight. Um, not just on behalf of Tofurkey, because, you know, let's say hypothetically that behind closed doors, a state attorney's general, attorney general's office was saying, oh, yeah, we can sign off and just say that, you know, this doesn't apply to you, that Tofurkey is not running afoul of these laws and you're fine. Well, we would say no uh, to that because we've been doing this for a long time for reasons other than profit. This is about mission for us. And seeing that this industry is poised for even bigger success is exciting to us. We feel like we've been stewards of this industry through the lean time. So we want to see it succeed to its maximum in the salad days. And I think that we're here right now. And that's what motivates me, motivates us. And that is a perfect segue um, to me thanking Jamie uh, for being uh, such an ideal plaintiff and willing to really stick his neck out on behalf of his company um, to enable us to uh, do these constitutional challenges to these unconstitutional laws. Um, Tofurkey is our plaintiff in several cases. Um, in, uh, we're challenging Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. Um, there's also a co-plaintiff, uh, Plant-Based Foods Association in Oklahoma, and a co-plaintiff, um, the Good Food Institute in Missouri. Um, and uh, a related case, I think you know we've established that these naming conventions are kind of uh, parallel to for both plant-based dairy and meat. So uh, Miyoko's for vegan butter products, for cultured vegan butter products. Um, we sued on Miyoko's behalf, the California Department of Food and Agriculture based on their enforcement position. That was a um, as applied First Amendment challenge as opposed to a facial challenge uh, for the rest of these. Um, and Oklahoma is not a, a First Amendment challenge. And I have to also thank Jamie for bringing a human aspect to these and a human face to these um, challenges because uh, what I'm about to do next is okay since this is a law school presentation, but I'm gonna get I'm gonna get into the <laughs> into the law. So apologies and thanks, Jamie, for making it interesting for a second. I'm gonna turn and make it boring. Um, in all of our cases, uh, with the exception of Oklahoma, we are putting forth a First Amendment argument um, because it's commercial speech, but because it's truthful commercial speech. Uh, Central Hudson is the standard. That's intermediate scrutiny. Um, so those are the prongs of Central Hudson, base, basically. Um, so of course, it's easy to show that these labels are truthful and non-misleading. Again, like I don't think anyone's buying plant-based sausage, saying that it's a real sausage or water-based sausage. Um, the government has to have a substantial interest uh, in protecting the speech. I'm happy to stipulate that protecting consumers is a substantial government interest, where these state laws really fall down are on the third and fourth prong. Um, they are not able to show that these restrictions, these bans on speech, are uh, do anything to uh, directly and materially advance protecting consumers against confusion, because there is no con confusion. And taking away these, these terms from plant-based producers 
as we saw in the Glackle study, actually causes more consumer confusion. So there they fall down on the uh, central Hudson prong. Um, they also fall down on the fourth one um, because they have to show the burden is on, on the government here. Um, they would have to put forth an empirical, empirical evidence. They would have to show this. They would also have to show that their restriction, which is, again, a complete ban on speech, isn't any more extensive than necessary to achieve their stated interests. So if they're concerned about consumer confusion, all they really have to say is, OK, just make it make clear somehow that it's plant based, which, again, producers are already doing. So they're they're is a very obvious cure and, and less extensive um, cure for consumer confusion, if it did exist, than an outright ban on speech. Um, so again, I think that, you know, looking at the, just a very strong First Amendment uh, cause of action here for these um, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana and the Miyoko's case. Um, we also put forth a, a due process claim on um, Due process basically says that it's a violation if the statute fails to provide people of ordinary intelligence a reasonable opportunity to understand when they're running afoul of these laws. I would like to think I'm of reasonable intelligence. <laughs> I'd like to think Jamie is too. Um, but I don't know how someone could know what exactly conduct is prescribed by representing, you can't represent something as me or misrepresent something as me or use a term defined in historical context in a certain way. Like that is poorly drafted to say the least. Uh, but thankfully, when you have laws out there that you know are not clear about what conduct is prescribed, especially when paired with you know criminal penalties or really, really severe civil penalties. You know, we, we've been talking about the criminal penalties. But the civil penalties could be just as ruinous to the plant-based uh, um, industry. You know, five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars per violation uh, per day, uh, and then you look at how many products are sold, and like Jamie said, um, online advertising counts. Um, that would just be absolutely ruinous to a lot of small companies getting getting off their feet and growing because of the consumer interest. Um, I would also like to point out that we do have a due process cause of action in our Oklahoma case. Um, courts, of course, read uh, read out vagueness in any due process cause of action. So it's some, sometimes not as popular of, uh, of a theory, but at least in Oklahoma, um, we don't know what the name of the product is. Um, that's unclear. And if the court were to read out the vagueness there and say, well, of course, that means the statement of identity per uh, federal regulations, then guess what, They're, that is preempted by federal regulation. So they can't do anything beyond or in addition to um, or different than these federal regulations. Um, so I think that we're on, on strong footing there. And I don't know how courts would read, represent something as neat in a constitutional way. So I feel pretty good about that cause of action as well. Um, we put forth dorm the Dormant Commerce Clause claim in I think all of our cases except Miyoko's. Um, we moved for a preliminary injunction, mostly on the due process and the First Amendment causes of action because they're just so strong. And also because the burden is on the state for those and not on us. Um, the burden would be on us for the Dormant Commerce Clause. And this is one of the primary uh, causes of action that we're putting forward in the Oklahoma case. Um, not just pipe balancing, which is basically weighing the burden on interstate commerce with any uh, benefit, the putative local benefit. And again, when we have absolutely no local benefit because consumers are not confused, when we have discrimination shown in the legislative context such that this local benefit is absolutely just pretext for you know, attacking um, competition and trying to prevent plant-based producers from engaging in interstate commerce, I think that that um, is of course clearly excessive. Um, and I also think that we're going to be able to show discrimination in the Dormant Commerce Clause context. Um, so, and the Supremacy Clause is a cause of action that we're only putting forward in Oklahoma. Um, again, that, that's a little bit different, but I'm sorry to be a broken record. Uh, it's a speech requirement, and that's why you see these different causes of action. Um, and again, not to get too in the weeds of uh, constitutional law, but um, for speech required, uh, rather than speech that's banned, um, for commercial speech, it's actually a, a lower standard. It's rational basis scrutiny uh, under Zotterer. And so basically the, the burden would be on us to show that there is no um, 
a reasonable relation between that and like a plausible local interest um, or uh, government interest, um, which is something that would be really hard to show um, and cases tend to not be successful there. Um, that was the initial cause of action put forward by the Institute for Justice. Um, and they were arguing that central Hudson intermediate scrutiny should apply to commercial speech. Um, and that uh, when Plant-Based Foods Association and Tofurky um, changed representation, we kind of pivoted because I have more interest in, um, you know, again, ensuring that even playing field and looking at the actual burdens of these laws. Um, and I'm personally kind of okay with um, federal government being able to require certain disclosures on products, things like uh, tobacco products and whatnot. Um, so another kind of creative cause of action we have um, in the Oklahoma case is basically arguing if the state takes the position that this product name is the same as statement of identity, um, the FTC has an express preemption provision that's very narrowly tailored. It only includes like 12 things. And thankfully for us, uh, statements of identity are one of them. So if this is purporting to do something or require something uh, in, different from or in addition to the FTCA there, um, then it would be um, expressly preempted. So <laughs> that's the a little bit of boring stuff, but I think that pivoting to the good news that we have so far on these cases is a nice way for me to end my my boring rants. Um, so far, we have a really excellent order on our motion for preliminary injunction in Arkansas. Um, we moved for preliminary injunction again on the due process and First Amendment, and I just have to read out. I know you guys can read, but I just love some of this language in here because it's such common sense and it's it's a very smart uh, ruling in my not so biased opinion. <laughs> um, and just the court said, the state appears to believe that the simple use of the word burger, ham or sausage leaves the typical, typical consumer confused, but such a position requires the assumption that a reasonable consumer will disregard all other words found on the label. That assumption is unwarranted. Additionally, there is no contention that any consumer or potential consumer was actually misled or deceived by Tofurka's packaging, labeling, or marketing. So basically, the court's very much on our side, um, found that Tofurka is likely to prevail on its uh, First Amendment claim. Right now, this is just waiting for uh, our supplementary brief asking the court to take that ruling on motion for preliminary injunction and change it into a final ruling because we're pretty happy with it. I would flag one thing, Arkansas's AGs defending this took the position and their law is that um, plant-based meat producers could not represent something as meat. It's very similar to Missouri's law that says uh, plant-based meat producers can't misrepresent something as meat. In Arkansas, the AGs took the position that Tofurky's laborers were clearly running afoul of the law. And that's what you get. This is the order we got as a result of that. In Missouri, the AGs took the odd position that no, 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 Tofurky's labels are fine. And actually, we can't point to any labels that are actually running afoul of the law um, because it says misrepresent. Um, I would argue, and we did just have um, an extended argument in Louisiana where the AGs took a similar tack that uh, when you have misrepresenting something as meat in, in the context where it is at the legislative, looking at the legislative history and in Louisiana where um, it goes on to list uh, all of the conduct that is considered misbranding and misleading. And one of these things is using meat terminology. Um, of course, this was designed to apply to plant-based meat producers, even if they did a kind of shoddy job of drafting it. Um, so in Arkan, or not, I'm sorry, in Missouri, uh, we appealed the denial of our motion for preliminary injunction. Um, it's back down at the district court level and we are kind of um, back at the discovery stage to basically push on the fact that um, the AGs have taken the position this doesn't apply to anyone. Um, so uh, we also have a really excellent ruling um, and it's a final ruling on our motion for summary judgment in Miyoko's. Um, <laughs> Again, uh, that's where the CDFA said they couldn't use these terms, but we were um, successful and the court said, um, Miyoko's can continue, continue using these phrases. And uh, my favorite quote here is, the state's sole asserted interest is avoiding consumer confusion because the record lacks material reasonably supporting the conclusion that removing the representations from Miyoko's labeling will in fact advance the interest to a minimal degree, the state may not enforce any order to that effect. 
Um, and I didn't put it in here, I don't think, but I should have because Jamie's point about language evolving, the court actually acknowledged that language evolves and the fact that there is a really old uh, standard identity for butter doesn't do anything to uh, persuade the court that a, a product being called vegan butter actually uh, means, I'm sorry, that an old uh, standard of identity for butter um, does anything to persuade the court that vegan butter misleads consumers in the current day and age. Um, and as I said at kind of the beginning, we do have good um, precedent from the Ninth Circuit on um, plant-based dairy products. This, again, was not in result as a result of any enforcement action on the state or federal level or any new law, but it was that consumer uh, protection class action. And again, here we have um, a federal appellate court saying that these naming conventions are not misleading. Um, and yeah, I think that right now, um, still pending before FDA, as I said, are several open or closed comments for um, on standards of identity. I think good money might be for the FDA is going to see these um, the trends in these federal courts and cases. And I don't think that, again, I'm going to knock wood here, but it's, I don't think that FDA is going to do anything differently. I, I expect FDA would allow plant-based uh, meat and dairy producers to continue using uh, standardized terms or meat terminology as long as it was part of a, a, a broader and non-misleading statement of identity. So I think that's all I have. Jamie, do you have anything else before we move on to questions? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> we should have left on a, a more interesting note other than statements of identity. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you both very much. Um, and Amanda, if you want to take down the um, screen share so that everybody can see the two of you for this discussion, that would be great. Thank you. Um, you've both done a great job laying out the business and the legal issues. And since you both have so much experience combined in lots of different jurisdictions uh, challenging these laws, I'm curious what you would say to the audience are your lessons that you've learned from successes and failures in challenging labeling laws, both from the legal perspective and the business perspective? Uh, I can hop on that one first from sure. the legal, legal perspective. I, When I got the Missouri AG's um, opposition to our motion for preliminary injunction, I was actually, I think I might've laughed out loud because I saw their argument that these laws don't apply to anyone. And it's like, well, why would the legislator bother, legislature bother passing a law that doesn't do anything beyond what's already kind of on the books. And again, uh, Missouri, like all these other states, have laws on the books that prevent anybody, including food producers, from misleading consumers, from mis uh, misbranding or mislabeling products. Um, so I think it was very clear to me that, no, 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 this, we can prove that this applies specifically to ban plant-based meat producers from using these terminal from this terminology. Um, I was actually shocked um, that the court agreed with the um, the AGs that as long as um, qualifying terms are used, uh, plant-based dairy or meat products are not running afoul of the law because that's not at anywhere in the law. There was a separate um, and later um, memorandum of enforcement from the Department of um, Agriculture in Missouri saying that, oh, here's how you can comply with the law. But that of course is non-binding. It doesn't change the fact that this law was on the books. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I think I still struggle with that, you know, the states putting up their hands saying, no, we didn't mean it. Like they clearly did mean it. Um, and I think that um, I'm surprised and I've learned <laughs> from that first case that we we do have to go above and beyond to show that uh, the intent behind these laws, what it was, um, because the drafting itself, I guess, is a little bit unclear. Great, thank you for that, Amanda. And Jamie, would you like to answer that question as well? Yeah, I guess more from the business perspective, you know, I think usually people expect that there's some sort of a profit motive or whatever with what, you know, whatever undertaking a business, you know, endeavors on. Um, and in that vein, there's been a lot of press around these these challenges. And I think it's really easy to, maybe it's just me, it's easy to adopt that kind of self-righteous tone and be mad at our legislators for failing us, you know, as constituents and whatnot. And so I think that other companies that want to take a more activist bent, there is that upside for them if that's what motivates them. 
lots of companies are really clamoring to get, you know, some mentions in the press. And, you know, it turns out that's not Tofurky's problem. We get a lot of earned media. Um, but I will say, you know, in the Missouri case, which that's when this whole kind of notion of this battle was fresh, we got about 1.2 billion uh, editorial media impressions, uh, which that doesn't mean that's how many people read those articles, but that's the, kind of the total readership of all the different outlets that talked about Tofurky in the context of these things. And so, you know, hopefully that is compelling to other companies that want to take a more activist bent. I think we could use that if we're a primarily capitalist society, consumer society, then, you know, really companies become super citizens, super constituents. And I think that we need to recognize that power or that responsibility and, and act appropriately. Sure. Great. Um, it, based on the patchwork of uh, the situation we have going on now and how harmful it has been for plant-based companies, what do you view as the best way to solve the issue? Should FDA step in? What would be an ideal situation? And if so, what would you like them to do? How's that for a big picture question? <laughs> and that can wanna, be both, both of you or either. I want to let Jamie go first because I think I'm going to disagree with him on this. Ooh, uh, this, this is good. I like I like when we have I, different views. I need to pivot off of your comments. I'm sorry. I'm going to insist that you go first. <laughs> All right. I, I would expect that some producers, maybe not Jamie, but uh, might want clarification from FDA. And I think that uh, a guidance document even just stating that the, these naming conventions are not uh, running afoul of the existing regs, they're actually complying with uh, common or usual name reg regulations, the statements of identity. I think that might be what some producers would want. Um, some part of my like very angry person inside of me that says, actually no clarification is necessary. This has been like in practice for decades and decades. There's never been any enforcement. Why do we need to waste FDA's time? Why do we need to have this like special treatment for plant-based producers when, you know, it's just plant-based producers there are, again, hundreds of thousands of products on the market right now. I could go blindfold into the grocery store and find, pick up a product and find lots of things wrong with the label and like how it doesn't comply with the regs. The fact that we have to, you know, have these special things about um, how plant-based meat producers can comply with regulations that apply universally seems, I don't know, a little bit insulting. And uh, beyond insulting, I also worry that any guidance they provide would ad add additional, um, be like, prescriptiveness to the ways that uh, plant-based meat producers can comply with the laws. As I said, you know, if they said if they just focused on the statement of identity um, and ignored the the four corners of the of the package itself and you know seals and all these, I want to maintain flexibility for plant based meat producers and in how they tell consumers what their products are. And I worry that kind of any additional clarification might um, take away some flexibility, even if it means um, not having to be a plaintiff in these uh, state challenges. Yeah. Well, I'm going to surprise you and agree with you, Amanda, which is maybe surprising to me also. I'm a bit of a prescriptivist myself. You know, I like to lament how literal and figurative are now synonyms and like, what is this world coming to? Um, but I just don't think that the bureaucracy of government can keep up with the kind of the, the speed of language development these days. It just It's just not practical anymore. And I guess to me, that's more important that people, the companies are able to do a good job of communicating what their products are to their consumers and those consumers are able to understand what it is they're trying to communicate it has to be that way that's the only you know good outcome here and so i'm going to let my prescriptivism kind of fall by the, the wayside and say we need something that can adapt mm -hmm. and that's also if fda did anything that would be great for the labels maybe if you you know didn't agree with me but that wouldn't cover the uh, marketing and advertising you know fda has a memorandum of understanding with ftc that's kind of ftc's jurisdiction so you know how i i don't know what guidance fda could provide you know it would have to be like a joint thing and i think that that's you know highly unlikely so. Great. Thank you both for entertaining that question. And also to remind um, our audience that you're welcome to submit questions through the Q&A feature, and um, we can pose those to our panelists as well. Um, Jamie, you've been involved in the Plant-Based Foods Association, but this question is also for both of you. Um, for people who are listening and just want to know what action items that they could take to support the industry in terms of policies or practices, do you have any suggestions in that regard? Other than, of course, purchasing 
purchasing power is important. Um, yeah, you know, I think, you know, educating ourselves and educating our, our friends, our peers um, is kind of job number one. I think I mentioned, maybe I didn't mention this, you know, I came into being a vegan ultimately because of kind of environmental reasons. I uh, read a book, it educated me, it kind of pointed out that, man, all these confusing questions that you are wasting your time on uh, every day that have an environmental component, you know, like whether to recycle this given an aluminum can or not, maybe are smaller in magnitude than the aggregate effect of just the eating decisions that you make. Um, and further, what those eating decisions really mean. You know, I think we're starting to talk more about the, the carbon release as a result of, you know, consumer decisions that we make. And that's great. That's a step in the right direction. But I think there are a lot of other externalities that um, we really haven't educated ourselves about as a society as much as we need to. You know, I live in a very rural place. I grew up on dairy farms, um, happen to be downwind of a mega dairy also. And I get to see the unregulated uh, air emissions that are a part of that, you know, and I, I've read enough to know that there's going to be surface and groundwater contamination that's a part of that also. Um, and ultimately, society bears the cost of that. And I think that a different regulatory set of priorities could mean that instead of cleaning that stuff up, we're not doing such a bad job and degrading the environment to begin with. Great. Thank you for that, Jean. Amanda, I did would you? Also, yeah, I, I, that's so important and good. And that just reminded me of something that, you know, we're doing our part, I think, between the two of us, between our organizations and companies to ensure that plant-based producers can continue selling um, un un unimpeded by, you know, silly laws. Um, and that's at the bottom of that, I think we've said it over and over again, is that so people can vote with their dollars. I think that these externalities and also subsidies that are kind of invisible, people are becoming educated on those subsidies because it's not really allowing market factors to work if people stop buying dairy, but then the US government steps in and buys up all the dairy that was surplus and then throws it into, you know, your SNAP program or, you know, just pays the dairy farmers to make products and then dump them out. Um, so I think that, you know, we're doing our part. I think that other than um, eating your conscience, I think that also voting your conscience is just absolutely crucial here. Um, and, you know, speaking as you know, those so perky packages said, talk to your legislators um, and let them know that not, not just these laws are silly, but also, um, you know, those government subsidies for you know, dying industries or harmful industries, um, you know, are not going unnoticed by their constituents. And I piggyback on there also, I think there's this yeah. false dilemma that's being presented to us also that either farmers can make animal products or we can solve the climate crisis. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think that you know, the, the reality of this kind of animal centric economy that we have right now came about because of a lot of policy decisions. We have the chance to take, for example, Amanda mentioned you know, buying surplus liquid milk, fluid milk. Um, we could take those same dollars, give them to the same dairy farmers, but do that in such a way that encourages them to adapt their business plan to this changing reality. And that's something that we need to pressure our representatives in government to do better at. They're, they're failing at it. Great. Thank you both for that. Um, in terms of the studies that you talked about, I will confess for this question that I have long had a what I just call tofurkey sandwich every day for lunch uh, for a very long time, and I've never been confused by the labels. I'm curious whether there are any studies that are showing there is consumer confusion, not about tofurkey specifically, but in the plant-based industry. Do you know of any, Amanda? <laughs> I, I know, I know of one actually. Um, it was funded by. I want to say it was. The, it, was, it was some meat industry group. I don't remember if it was NAMI or a Cowman's Association, um, but it was a, a very a problematic methodology used. And it was like, do you agree or like really agree that this is confusing? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, it, and looking at it, it's a, it's a pretty laughable study. And it's the one when if you hear us make derisive comments about like veggie disc or puck or, or tube or finger, that's the study that I'm like thinking of. Um, and it said consumers really de definitely want them to be called veggie tubes or fingers. I, that's to be a bit instead of veggie sausage. Um, the funny thing about that is in preparation for, you know, some presentation or there, I was trying to find that study and it's the only one I'm aware of and they took it down. It's, it's not there anymore. It, it, it was, it was, yeah. So, uh, 
um, yeah, again, not not passing the sniff test. So that's the only study or empirical evidence showing that. And and beyond that, it's just complete dearth out there. Um, and we haven't in these in these cases, um, the states have not put forward any evidence of confusion. And that also means that the legislators are not looking at that in, in evidence before passing these laws. So again, the motivation is kind of like very clear. So no is the uh, short answer <laughs> to your question. Great, thank you. And Jamie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? No, I mean, I guess other than emphasizing that there are like 15% of people that are confused about basically everything. And so I wouldn't emphasize too much the 15% or whatever in the studies that we did present that were confused. I think that they probably also believe the Loch Ness Monster exists and all kinds of other wacky things. Actually, or that was uh, one of the felt studies found like 24% of consumers were confused by plant-based dairy, but I think 27% were confused by animal-based dairy. They just like didn't know what skim milk was. So like if, to the extent that any like this confusion exists, they're actually probably more confused by animal-based dairy naming conventions and, and labeling. So, um, and if you're interested in kind of the, the court's ruling on that, I think just looking at the order on the motion for preliminary injunction in the OCOC does a good job um, discussing those studies. And I've shared a stage with people that are in the like uh, free range beef business before too. And they've talked a lot about how there is a lot of confusion or a lot of like sides taken in, you know, how you finish your beef grain fed versus grass fed versus free range, you know, all those sorts of nuances matter a lot. And, you know, if they can't even within the meat industry kind of get their hands around the nomenclature and setting the right expectation for consumers, then, you know, I, I don't think it's, necessarily a, a problem unique to plant-based that 15 or so percent of people are confused, again, by everything mm -hmm. practically. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a few minutes left and I wanted to ask each of you, if you're both welcome to answer the question um, based on your presentations, and I'm sorry, my dog is right here, so that's the tail you're seeing <laughs> <laughs> over my shoulder. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, given the landscape where it is and the victories you're you're experiencing and you know some defeats here and there, what's the path forward in this space? Well, I, you know, I'll just say again, I think that we all could stand to be more engaged constituents. And you know, I've been pleasantly surprised by how easy it has been to you know get appointments with my own elected representatives. And um, that is their job. I shouldn't be surprised by that. Their doors should be open to their constituents. We should be able to tell them how we feel. And maybe they disagree, maybe they don't disagree, but it's a chance to plead our case and let them know what matters to us as their potential future voters for their reelection. I think that we could all do more of that. Great, thank you. Um, Amanda, your thoughts? Just with my litigation hat on, um, I think that even our quote unquote losses were still a victory because if you know the eighth circuit says this law doesn't apply to anyone and doesn't do anything i still think that hey that's, that's we're sitting pretty in terms of being able to engage in these naming conventions um what i think is going to happen um looking at you know all these laws coming down the pike and what i hope happens is that you know we, we establish some good law and that future legislators and states just lose their appetite for you know passing these laws at the behest of the industry um, whether or not that's going to be the case, I don't know. I'm terrible at reading tea leaves, and I thought that disclosure laws were going to be the next state, but um, currently I think there are four laws that I know of um, that are, or sorry, bills that are being considered, and they're all right back to those bans, which again, I think of as just like very, very strong First Amendment um, challenges because, yeah, they're blatantly unconstitutional. Um, and then in the long term, Based on consumer behaviors, interest, purchasing decisions, I would really love, if I'm being you know, an optimist, for the industry to just get on board with this and stop wasting taxpayer dollars, stop you know, wasting legislators' time, stop. I, I would love to not do these cases, no offense to Jamie. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that you know their um, kind of death throes panic of attacking the other industry is just not being met with um, broad range support, it's really kind of um, not giving consumers much uh, credit. I think that they're losing credibility. Um, and I think like Jamie said that, you know, helping farmers in the industry, uh, I really seeing them diversify in their portfolios. I think transitioning um, at the, the farmer level too is something that I really hope is what we see coming up. Great, thank you both. Thank you both for your expertise and a really engaging and interesting discussion. And with that, we will go ahead and take our next break. Thank you. Thank you.